Hey guys, in this video we're going to talk about succession. Uh, ecological succession is a series of more or less predictable changes that occur in a community over time. The picture that I have here is of a secondary succession. If you take a look, in the very left, this is where it starts. You notice that there is some grass there and there are some small trees. Over time, those small trees grow to be larger, but they're not quite done. You'll see some new smaller trees coming in here. As we continue that time, we get those tall trees becoming more and more mature. And then finally, what we end up with is our climax community. And we'll talk about this a little bit more, but again, ecological succession is a series of more or less predictable changes that occur in a community over time. There are two main types of succession. Primary is when there are no living organisms present at the beginning. Typical examples of this would include volcanic eruptions that will completely cover an area with lava and glacial receding. A glacier will recede over time, melting, and what is left behind it is simply rock and dirt. There's no living organisms left there. Secondary succession is when some organisms are left at the start of succession. If you think about these two types of succession, because primary starts with no life and secondary starts with some life left, that should tip you off to the fact that secondary succession is a shorter process than primary. Taking a look at this, this is the example I talked to you about with lava flow. This type of lava is called a -a lava, and this is a picture from Hawaii. It has completely covered the ground there. There's no living organisms, and so life will have to restart from the very beginning. We'll start off by seeing lichens and mosses start to colonize it, and they'll move in from other locations. As they do so, they're going to slowly break down this rock, and what they'll end up with is soil. They'll actually break that rock down into soil. Over time, when the soil is kind of built up a little bit, other grasses can move in. They'll outcompete the mosses, they'll become a grassy area. Eventually, when there's enough soil, you'll have trees move in, and primary succession will continue. This is a similar patch, but after a good long while. And if you take a look, it might have been 10, 12 years, but now we've got some small ferns growing. Clearly, there is moss growing on these rocks. You can see the, mo the rocks look kind of fuzzy. That's the moss and the lichens. So this once looked just like the previous one, but over years, those pioneer species have moved in, they've started to break down that rock, and they've created some soil for organisms to use. This is a timeline of what you might see in primary succession. You notice it can take upwards of 15 years before you really start to see those pioneer species showing up. It could be a long time of just rock. By the, by the time you went about 35 years, you've got some grasses available. By the time you're 80 years, you have some small woody plants like bushes, shrubs, things like that. And it's not until you really get outside of 80 years that you start to see f actual forest show up. We have these hard woody trees. It can take 115 plus years to reach climax immunity through primary succession. Again, like I said before, the first species to colonize a barren area are called pioneer species. One ecological pioneer that grows on bare rock is called a lichen. It's a mutual, mutual symbiosis between a fungus and an algae. And these two things work together. They can actually break down the rock. They're able to fix their own nitrogen. And what they do is they slowly over time will break that rock down using some of the byproducts they have there. In the picture at the bottom, I've highlighted only the lichens that are there to show you that pioneer species. Again, secondary succession is when some organisms are left after succession. These two pictures show secondary succession well. On the left, this is immediately after a forest fire. Not even a week before a fire had come through, it had burnt this particular area, and so that is the start of secondary succession. It's a great example for it. After a while, a few months, maybe even a couple years, you see the picture on the right. Clearly, this area has been a lot longer since the initial event, that forest fire. You can see the trees are a little less black as they continue to grow and heal from the wounds. You can see grasses starting to come back. There are, however, some organisms who only germinate after a forest fire. So they've evolved to work with this secondary succession mechanism. This is a timeline that shows what happens in secondary succession. On the left-hand side, you'll see it starts off with some event that leaves some organisms there. As time progresses, maybe three, four years, you're going to start to see small plants, maybe some woody, woody shrubs. By about five years, you see trees show up, and about the time you get to that 20-year mark, you'll have something that resembles a forest. Forty-plus years will lead you back to your climax community, or what the particular location is supposed to look like. Compare that to the 115-plus years, and you can see that primary succession can take twice as long as secondary succession.
Good examples are wildfires, hurricanes, and other natural disturbances like typhoons. These things damage the ecosystem, but they don't completely get rid of organisms. These two pine cones are the example I was talking about before. You can tell that the one on the left has been burnt because the edges are black and charred, and you notice that it's open. The one on the right is not open. This particular pine cone species only opens after a fire. So the species has evolved to, to actually take advantage of the forest fire. If it dropped its seeds before there was a fire, the seeds wouldn't be able to survive because there's grasses down there, there's shrubs down there. But once all of those have been burnt, they're not there anymore, which gives that seed an opening to survive. You also can have secondary succession after deforestation. This particular picture is in the Amazon. The field on the right once was agricultural. What happens in the Amazon is they cut down large areas of forest. They will then grow crops on them, but they don't do it in a sustainable manner. Oftentimes, they'll leave that field fallow just because they farmed it out for what it was worth, and they'll cut down a new section. Succession after deforestation is a form of secondary succession. There are still organisms there. However, sometimes... If you use the land for agriculture, you can have pulled so many nutrients out of the soil that it makes it almost impossible for the ecosystem to turn back into its original climax community. I've used the word climax community a lot, and I wanted to explain what that is. A climax community is the final stage that an ecosystem takes. Basically, it's made up of all of the organisms that compete best there. Our particular climax community for where we're at is this picture. It's a beech maple forest. You might have heard about other trees, such as oaks or hickories. And, and there are areas where oaks and hickories are the climax community. But in our area, the beech trees and the maple trees will outcompete those oak trees and hickory trees. And what that means is that over time, our forest will end up being predominantly beech and maple trees with some smaller woody shrubs underneath them. It will look something like this picture. You can see down here that you've got a fallen tree. And that fallen tree has opened up in this area for new trees to grow but they're still going to be beech and maple trees because they were, they're what competes best. So a climax community is going to be different for each biome, but it's what organisms compete best there. Many organisms make their living on waiting for secondary succession to occur. They can't survive in the climax community where everything is the peak, but they can survive in those off periods where a forest fire has come through or a hurricane has come through. What we see is that communities that have constant disturbances will actually have a little bit higher biodiversity because they'll have some of those climax community members, but they'll also have the other ones that just can't survive if the climax community is left to go. If you look at patterns of succession, on both Mount St. Helens and Mount Krakatoa where volcanic eruptions happen, primary succession proceeded through predictable stages. It happened like we described earlier, where you had those lichens show up that then made some soil and helped mosses get there. After a while of having lichens and mosses, you had small plants come in like grasses or shrubs and over about 115 years they'll end up getting back to climax community. The first plants and animals that arrive had seeds or spores from adult stages that traveled over long distances. Even in primary succession we're not talking about these organisms re-evolving. They're simply moving back in. We call those pioneer species because they're going to help stabilize loose volcanic debris and they're going to enable later species to take hold because these pioneer species of lichen and mosses, they can handle a more harsh environment than some other things. Historical studies in Krakatoa and ongoing studies on Mount St. Helens have confirmed that early stages of primary succession are slow. And that chance can play a huge role in determining which species colonize at different times. If no lichen spores ever get to the new location, then lichens can't arise there. So we have to have them moving in. So there is an an amount of chance with primary and secondary succession.